Hello everyone. Welcome back to this workshop on um, the online research methodology organized by the Best Society for Research International, that is the RSRI group. So on this day two, we are meeting again. So we'll continue with our day one discussion where we discussed about uh, some journals, we discussed about their indexing, we discussed about impact factors, and we're discussing more on this. So uh, this session, which is called the journals indexing impact factors and more in this, uh, we'll today carry forward from what we have discussed yesterday and we'll try to look at some of the statements or some of the points that we have made yesterday and we'll try to elaborate on them. So, <clears throat> so far we have seen that there is no substitute for the quality research that we do. We have also seen that uh, peer review is an important component of the uh, publishing or, or the getting a, getting a paper published in a journal. So again, peer review can be of three different types, blind, double blind and triple blind. And then uh, we also saw uh, the different types of journals that are out there. Uh, they can be broadly classified into the limited access journals, the open access journals, and the predatory journals. I know that a lot of uh, queries have come in on the predatory journals. And so people are a little confused that what are these? People have heard about, some of the people have already heard about limited access journals and open access journals, but they've not heard about something called the predatory journals, and they were a little confused, and I used the term predatory journals. Well, we'll discuss more on them, uh, more on these predatory journals in our uh, subsequent, uh, like, uh, subsequent slides. But uh, what I want to state here is that, that this distinction that I've made, that is not uh, a pure sort classification. Means in terms of this subscription, if you think, we have only two different kinds of journals, the limited access journals and the open access journals. Predatory journals can be both limited access journals and open access journals. Predatory journals, as the name suggests, they try to fool the researchers. They try to uh, they try to harm the scientific community in a sense that uh, they publish uh, very low quality uh, they publish low quality or no quality papers in them, and they charge the authors a huge amount of money in in uh, for publishing their work. And these journals have no value whatsoever because they are not peer reviewed. They do not have any uh, good uh, policy related to the editorial. And all that we'll try to discuss more on this that what is predatory journals in our subsequent uh, slides so we also saw that uh, traditionally the publishing business uh, was like on print and online still there are certain journals who do both on print as well as online and therefore the uh, cost is going to be high for them and then we saw that a lot of subscription based journals like uh, the lot of the journals in the Elsevier they are now offered only in the online mode so they have tried to reduce their uh, they've tried to reduce their cost somewhat. And then we saw that uh, with the new millennia, the uh, rise of the online journals or rather the open access journals where the author pays the cost for publishing and it is available freely to the scientific community for reading. So, and we saw that uh, in general, a study was done on this and it was seen that the cost of publishing is the least in open access journals. We also uh, saw how the open access journals has evolved um, uh, in the last decade. And uh, as I was telling that this is the current trend till 2010, where you see that about 75% of the journals that are there uh, are uh, closed journals or the subscription based journals. But in the upcoming 10 years, maybe if you look at 2030, what you will find is that uh, this graph will be reversed. The subscription journals will be limited to only like 25%. And the rest 75 percent would be the open access journals we also saw the different kinds of articles that are out there and uh, what are those we then discussed about a little about indexing so i i told that indexing is nothing but you can think of indexing like a, a similar kind of products are grouped together okay. so in that sense general indexing is something is a is a uh, bibliographical database or is a database where articles from similar kind of journals are put together. So indexing is generally done by a number of agencies and among them the most uh, or in fact there are different kinds of indexing. Uh, let's not go into the who does the indexing. Let's say that what are the indexings that are available. The indexings that are generally available for especially for the science background are the SCI or science and engineering background or these SCI, SCIE and these are considered as the most reputable. So both of these indexings are given by an organization called the Clarivate Analytics. And 
there is also something called if I understand that a lot of participants are from communities background, maintenance and management background, they, might, they should look at the equivalent of SCI in uh, in the maintenance that is called the SSCI. So SSCI stands for Social Sciences Citation Index. So that is an equivalent journal, that is an equivalent uh, journal indexing of the SCI and the SCIE category. So SCI and SCIE category are uh, generally for the science and the engineering background, and SSCI is for the humanities and the management background. Okay. Though there may be some significant overlap, there might be some journals which are interdisciplinary, and they can have both of these indexings. So <coughs> basically, we saw that. Uh, general indexing is like a catalog where I will again say this general indexing is like a catalog where similar kind of products or similar kind of journals are grouped together. Here, the similarity is not based on the contents they have, rather on the quality that they have. Similar quality journals are grouped together. So it means the uh, list that we have or the SCI, SCIE and the SSCI list or the database that we have, it contains the most prestigious or most quality wise good journals in this list. Then comes the second category that is called the Scopus. Scopus is a little broader category. So in Scopus, uh, you can say that we have something ranging from the, uh, all the journals which are indexed in the SCI, SCIE and SSCI are also listed in the Scopus. Additionally, a few more journals are also, uh, a few, not exactly few, a few thousand more, uh, almost twice of that is in the SCI that is being additionally covered in the Scopus. So right now, I think uh, in the SCI, we have some around, 11,000, some around uh, 15,000 in the SCI, SCI, and uh, SSCI list, we have around 15,000, whereas in the Scopus, we have close to around 40,000. So it's almost like uh, three times in the Scopus, uh, covers almost three times the number of the journals that SCI, SCI, and SSCI uh, contains. So Scopus, again, uh, if we think of it in our term, uh, then we can say that it is the second tier or the second category or the second best journals, second best group of journals that is out there. So <clears throat> uh, all the journals that are in the SCI are also in the Scopus. And uh, the Scopus journals are being, the Scopus is again a database that is uh, that is managed by, or that is under the Elsevier Publishers Group. And then again, we saw that uh, when the Scopus was started in around 2004, I hope it was started around 2004, so when Scopus was started in 2004, so uh, the Thomson Reuters group at the time, Thomson Reuters was the uh, manager for the SCI. So the Thomson Reuters group found that uh, uh, LCV is aggressively pushing their product of Scopus among the uh, among these uh, publishing community. So they came up with a similar product called the ESCI or the ESCI category, that is the Emerging Sources Citation Index. And again, uh, till now, uh, we see that the ESCI and the Scopus has kind of similar kind of coverage, but the ESCI has still not gained that kind of reputation because it is relatively newer. I think it is around only the 2012 or 13 or something, somewhere later that the ESCI was started. So ESCI can be thought of a pathway for the journals to be uh, grouped into the SCI. For example, if I have a journal and I, I want the SCI group to evaluate it or the private analytics group to evaluate it and list it in the SCI, SCIE or SSCI. So once I apply, so if my journal is found to be uh, very quality wise, very superior and it meets and it meets all the criteria of the uh, SS uh, or the of the SCI, SCI and SSCI list, then it will be directly put in the SCI list. But if suppose say out of the 10 criteria, suppose I'm saying that there are 10 criteria and out of the 10 criteria, I'm meeting only on eight criterias and uh, the remaining two criterias, I have somewhat filled 20% or supposed to say 50%. So in that case, the Claybit Analytics Group will place my journal in the ESCI category. So ESCI is Emerging Sources Citation Index. So it means my journal has showed some potential and maybe in future it can be grouped into the SCI or the SCI list, but right now it doesn't meet the entire standards of the SCI and SCI list. So now they are putting it in kind of a wait list kind of thing and that wait list is called the ESCI. Yeah. You can think of it that way. And then again, we saw about Google Scholar. So Google Scholar is basically not an indexing uh, website. It's rather a, a very powerful search engine like the Google itself. So what Google Scholar does is that it tracks all the scientific papers that are out there and it tries to, it, it try to uh, make a database of it. So in that sense, it is an indexing, but uh, again, it doesn't have any quality requirements. So in that sense, it is not an indexing. So the best answer for Google Scholar would be, it is like a, uh, it is like a uh, 
search engine that maintains a database of all the papers that are out there. It is uh, not exactly an indexing in the sense that it doesn't have any quality requirements to be included in the uh, in the in the database. And all the other uh, uh, examples that uh, all the other indexings that I showed you, for example, SCI, Scopus, and ESCI, all of them have some quality requirements. Only when you pass that quality, you can enter into one of these groups. But in Google Scholar, if it is any paper that is available on the internet, can be index it can be uh, it will be in the Google Scholar database. We saw the uh, uh, starting of the SCI, where we saw that SCI was initially started by Eugene Garfield, and it was given, and he founded a organization called the Institute of Scientific Information, which was later purchased by the Thomson Reuters Group, and uh, recently it has been purchased by some Onyx Corporation or someone. And now the Onyx Corporation has made a separate entity called the Clarivate Analytics Group, and the Clarivate Analytics Group is now is the manager for the SCI. So now SCI is being managed by the Clarivate Analytics Group. So it was officially founded in 1964, and uh, now, uh, as, as I told you, some of the world's most prestigious journals are the listed in the SCI. By definition, when I say SCI, I also mean SCIE and SSCI. Uh, so these are listed in here. So the most prestigious journals are grouped in the SCI, SCIE, and SSCI, and they have two online platforms, just like uh, the Google Scholar. If you think of Google Scholar as a platform where you can search, similarly. Uh, the SCI, the Clever Analytics has two platforms. One is named as the SCI Search, and the other is named as the Web of Search. So through these platforms, you can access this list. So we'll see about these platforms in a while. And then we saw about Scopus. That Scopus was launched in around 2004, and uh, it contains around 34,377. I think this figure is now somewhere around uh, 40,000. We'll see that uh, how much it is. And <clears throat> basically, uh, similarly. Uh, the SCI uh, gives out a uh, ranking or a metric. For example, when you when you write in an exam, and at the end of the exam, uh, if they just tell you if, if you are pass or fail, it will you will not be that happy. But if they tell you uh, along with the pass marks, if they tell you the marks also, if they tell you that okay you have scored seventy percent, you have scored ninety percent, that would be an additional motivation for you, right? So otherwise, there will not be enough motivation for you. So that is why, in the similar manner, in the scientific community, for the journals, there is something called the impact factor. So impact factor is basically the reputation of a journal. We'll discuss more on the impact factor. But just right now, just understand that impact factor is like the reputation of a journal. But higher the value of the impact factor, impact factor is a numeric value. It is. It can be a numeric value. It's a real numeric value. So uh, the real number numeric value. So higher the value of the impact factor, better is the prestige of the journal, higher is the prestige of the journal. So similar to the impact factor that is being given by the Scopus, so the, uh, by, the, uh, by the SCI or the Clever Analytics, Scopus also gives certain impact factors, which they call as, they started with something called the uh, SJR, then uh, they started with something called the SNIP, then they gave out a site score, then they gave out SJR, and they we'll see each of them, what they means, we'll see them in the, Again, we saw about Google Scholar that Google Scholar was launched around the same time as the Scopus in the 2004 and Google Scholar is freely accessible to all. It is basically a powerful web search engine with, uh, which has access to all the, all the papers out there in the internet. If any paper is there in the internet, then Google Scholar can find it. Now, recently they have extended this Google Scholar to the patents also. So now you can search. Uh, patents also in the Google Scholar. Now let us come to the important question that all of us have that what is basically citation index and what is a citation index? As I told you about the example regarding the student who is uh, who is writing an exam and we tell him the marks after the exam. So similarly, uh, when a journal is sent to the uh, web to the graduate analytics for grouping in the uh, web of sciences. So web of science is a uh, web of science is like a grouping of all these journals that all, all the of all the uh, indexings that the Clayberry Analytics Group gives, so Clayberry Analytics Group, as I told you, it gives uh, rank, it gives indexings like SCI, SCIE, SSCI, ESCI, and there are certain other uh, indexings like this. For example, chemical uh, chemical indexing, or suppose say mathematical indexing, like this. They give a number of different sub indexings also. So all these together are called as the Web of Science. And uh, Scopus is a separate database that is maintained by the Elsevier and Web of Science is maintained by this Clever Analytics. 
So basically, as I told you, the example of the student who is writing an exam and after the exam, you're giving him marks. Similarly, when a journal is evaluated and included by the uh, Calibrate Analytics in its Web of Science or by Elsevier in its Scopus, it gives something like similar to a mark to that particular journal. And that, uh, that uh, particular mark is called as the citation index. So basically, what citation index is, uh, in layman's term, what citation index is, suppose say, if I publish a paper, uh, so how many times it has been referenced by other researchers in their work? It means how many citations I have received. So citations is when I write a paper, when uh, when I have written a paper and it is out there in the, in the world for the scientific community to read. And suppose say now you are writing a paper and in your paper, you you reference my paper, right? Uh, you use the you use the outcomes of my paper. You reference my paper in that in your paper. Then after your paper is published, my uh, citation becomes one, or my citation increases by one because you have in, uh, you have included one of my paper in your reference. So after your paper is published, I, I should again remind you again and again that the citation will be counted only after your paper is published. If your paper is rejected, I do not get any citation. If even if you are including my reference, and your paper is not published, so I do not gain any citation. If suppose say I have written a paper, when that same paper you are using as a reference in your paper, and you have also published your paper, now I will get one citation, or I will get my citation will increase by one. Again, here is one misconception among the researchers that suppose say when I'm writing the text, if I am putting the reference two times, if suppose say uh, if you are uh, referencing one of my papers and if you are putting it in two different places then uh, for me it will be counted as two references two citations no it is not like that one paper uh, one particular paper which is in the reference of another paper will be counted only once no matter how many times it is being cited inside the text okay? no matter inside the text how much times you cite it if a particular paper is cited at least once in the entire paper then reference count will be one or the citation count will be one okay will increase by one so uh, like this, this citation is counted. So similarly, uh, what the journals does is that it groups all the citations that it's all these papers in its journals get. For example, in my case, uh, since you are referencing only one of my papers, so my citation counted increased by one. But think of it from the journal's perspective. If suppose say the journal has published 10 papers in a year and you have referenced uh, three uh, particular, uh, three particular of its papers in your paper, so now for the journal, the yearly citation will increase by one, means it will gain, uh, sorry, it will gain not one by three. So it will get three new citations to its papers. Okay. So that is how the citation works. Okay. So every, for example, let me, if it is not clear, let me try to give you a more example. Uh, is there any paper I have here? Is the paper that I have? Okay. Suppose say, this is uh, some paper that we are writing and we are trying to send uh, on uh, diamond like carbon thin frames. So here, suppose say, yeah, here, suppose say, I have, uh, I, I'm using some statement, I'm, I'm using certain statement and uh, for this statement, I need to give some source that from where this uh, statement can be validated or from where this statement is seen. So I've given here seven and eight, seven comma eight. So this statement I have taken, or this information that I've uh, given in this statement, I've taken from this source seven and eight. So I'm, so I'm citing them, okay? So now what will happen is that if you go down in your reference section, you will see that I have source seven and eight. So now when for, suppose say for McKenzie, as soon as my paper will be published, McKenzie will gain one citation, okay? McKenzie, both McKenzie, Muller, and uh, this guy, uh, philanthrope all of them will gain one one citation all of their citations will increase one 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 and similarly when this paper is published mashito asayoga and fuji all of them will gain one one citation all of their citations will increase one by one but if you look closely here there is a particular journal called the diamond related materials here again there is another uh, paper from the diamond related materials so it means when my paper is published so diamond uh, materials will get one citation for this one citation for this, one increment in the citation for this, one increment in the citation for this, one increment in the citation for this, and so on. Every time a paper from the diamond related materials is cited here, so the number of the citations of this journal increases, right? So in this way, 
in the similar way for a researcher it is calculated and in the similar way for a journal it is calculated okay so all the metrics that we have out there the performance metrics similarly for the uh, student who has scored some marks in the exam that is his performance metric that is how well he has performed similarly for the journals also the performance metric is the citation index so citation is the basic thing based on the citation there are different kinds of varieties in which we can express the citation for example if you again come back to the student who has uh, written exam so at the end of the exam we can give his marks in terms of percentage otherwise what we can do we can say we can group the percentage together and we can give a grade that you are getting grade a grade b so there are different kinds of uh, ways in which we can express the marks of a student we can express it in pure uh, numbers we can express it in percentage we can express it in grades we can express it in gpa or in some other scale from one to four scale or suppose say one to five scale so these are all different kinds of scales that we are using but the basic information is what basic information is what he has written in the exam and based on that how many marks he has given so the marks is the basic information and based on that marks we are giving some other kind of metric like the grade or the percentage or whatever so similarly in case of journal the citations is the basic quantity and based on the citation we have different kind of uh, we have different kind of scales or we have different kind of uh, metrics that we can give we'll see more on that so now uh, the first citation this first the cite this first citation index is the impact or it is the most reputable citation web of science and it is generally calculated from the SCI, SCIE and SSCI list by the Clairvit and Lick group. So now uh, impact factor, sometimes it is also known as IF in capital letter. So as I told you, it was started by the Institute of Scientific uh, Information and it was way later than they, when they, almost after 10 years of the establishment of this group that they started with this impact factor. And this number was again developed by the same guy, Eugene Garfield, uh, Dr. Eugene Garfield. So it was started from 1975. So now let us try to understand how this impact factor works. Okay? Let us try to understand this. So basically, if you see the impact factor, suppose say the impact factor is equal to citation y minus one plus citation y minus two by publication y minus one plus publication y minus two. So basically what I mean here is that the impact factor is calculated as, suppose say the impact factor for 2020, okay? The impact factor for 2020 will be calculated as number of the number of the uh, citations that the papers which are published in this particular journal in 2019 and number of the citations that the number of the papers that uh, for the papers that were published in 2018 divided by the total number of publications in 2018 and 2019 but the catch is there that only the citations which are in the current year will be taken i will tell you again what it is Suppose say in this particular year, a lot of papers have been published, for example, in the 2020. In the 2020, a lot of papers have been published till now. So all the citations that are there in the 2020, among them, the citations which are for the papers in 2018 and 2019, only they will be counted, okay, in here, okay. Only the papers, only the citation for the papers from 2018 and, uh, sorry, 2019 and 2018 will be counted and it will be divided by the total number of papers that the journal has published in 2018 uh, 2019 and 2018 okay but the catch is that, that all these citations should be from 2020 for this year okay from 2020 they should have been cited in 2020 but for the items that are from 2018 and 2019 so let us see it by an example it will be more clear so nature is one of the uh, top journals one of the top three journals uh, out there so let us see how nature the impact factor for nature was calculated in 2017 for example if you calculate the impact factor of nature in 2017 then all the citations that nature received in 2017 okay the citations should be received in 2017 okay the citations should be there in the papers which have been published in 2017 not necessarily only the papers in nature but any journal okay any journal which is indexed in the web of science okay so any journal which is web in which is indexed in the web of science that contains in 2017 that was published in 2017 that contains citations from 2016 citations to papers from 2016 and citations to papers from 2015 will be taken into account and they will be divided by the total number of the papers that the nature published in 2016 and the nature published in 2015 okay 
So in that way, suppose say here I have given the values. Uh, the suppose say in the uh, 2016, in 2017, uh, the Nature received around 32,000 citations for all the papers that were published in 2016. So I have written it here. And similarly, for in 2017, uh, the Nature received 41,000 citations for all the papers that were there in the 2015 divided by the total number of papers it has published in 2016 it has published 80 papers and in 2015 it has published 905 902 papers so just you take the value of this ratio of this and you come across a number 41.577 so generally imperfectors uh, uh, express in this form up to three digit okay up to three digit after decimal so it means what it means now it means that the each of the each of the uh, papers that were published in 2015 and 16 it means if you think of this this is nothing but the ratio or the average right so 8 uh, 880 plus 902 it is roughly around uh, how much it is it is uh, 1800 minus 18 so it is around 1888 uh, so this 1888 papers okay 1882 papers so all this 1882 papers that we have this 1882 papers uh, received this 1882 papers from 2016 and 15 received approximately each of these papers received approximately 42 citations in 2017 okay it, it the impactor doesn't care about what you got in 2018 what you got in 2015 it doesn't care about that it cares about only the number of citations that you received in that particular year so in 2017 each of these papers that were published in the previous two years received an average of 42 citations. That is what the impact vector means. So impact vector basically is a measurement of how many times a part, how many times on an average a journal a paper is uh, referenced, okay, or how many times a, a, a average paper is cited. Okay, so it means higher the citations here, more people are reading it, obviously. When more people will read it more people will find it useful when more people will find it useful they will put it in their reference so the impact factor basically means that the papers that are published in that particular journal have been found uh, useful by the others and they have been referenced in their own articles and now the average citation for each of the papers that were published in the previous two years is 42 in 2017 and similarly this is done every year for example uh, now, every year in the month of May or June, the Clavier Analytics releases this uh, uh, impact factor. It is, uh, a, they publish a document called the JCR or the uh, Journal journal Citation Records or, uh, yeah, Journal Citation Record. So every year in the month of May to June, or between May to July, they release this document. So in this document, they update the uh, impact factor every year. Again, another important thing you have to see is that, what is this? This is what is this? This is the number of, uh, this is for 2017. This is for all the citations that was received in 2017. Okay. So it means when in 2020, they released the impact factor, they will be actually releasing the impact factor for 2019 because for this to be calculated for impact factor 2017. Okay. Uh, you need all the data that was there in the 2017. Okay. So now in 2020, when they release, they will release it for 2019 because 2019 is over. Uh, so till now they have collected all the data they have analyzed all the data and based on that they will give the impact factor of 2019 in 2020 similarly for 2020 impact factor they will give in 2021 so impact factor is uh, at, at one year lag from the actual calendar year okay? because we need the data from that particular year so for 2020 impact factor will come in the next year okay. similarly there is something called the SGR that is being launched by the Scopus so again, the concept of SGR is also similar to the concept of uh, the by the uh, SCI. So here also, if you have higher SGR values, you have greater prestige and so on. Okay. So <clears throat> let's not go deep into this because this is not so widely accepted. Uh, this statement should not be here. So this this. Uh, and this uh, SGR is not so widely accepted or because Scopus uh, is the, I told you, Scopus is the second uh, favorite thing among the serious researchers. SCI is the first favorite thing among the researchers. So people, uh, as, uh, the LCBR is aggressively trying to market its SGR, but still uh, people has not 
people have not accepted it in a very wholehearted fashion. But just remember this, that if your journal that you're publishing that has higher SGR, it means the journal prestige is higher. Again, similar to the formula that the credible analytics gave for the uh, impact vector, uh, the Scopus came up with another uh, similar kind of uh, term called the site factor. It is also basically based on the citation itself. And they came up in 2016 by the Elsevier. And uh, here, instead of two years, I explained you the formula for two years. Instead of two years, here they are taking the three years. So it is basically the same as, it is basically a variant of the impact factor. So just that Elsevier wanted to do something new, they wanted to market their product. So instead of taking two years, now they are saying that, no, no, we should take three years at least. So now they have taken three years and here uh, the calculation for the same uh, 2017 edition that now uh, instead of 42, it has become 14. Here you see that for the last two years, it was 41. And here, if we include the data for 2014 also, it becomes 14 or roughly 15, you can say. So basically, generally, it is seen that site score is a little less than the uh, site score is a little less than the impact factor, primarily because of two things. First thing is that they include three years. And the second thing is that in the formula, here they have made another change. What change they have made is that I told you some time ago, I told you about the different kinds of articles. That is why the different kinds of articles are important. There is the different kinds of articles. I told you about the different kinds of articles somewhere. I think, yeah different types of articles. So when uh, the SCI impact factor is calculated or the Clarivate Analytics impact factor is calculated, only this and this are taken as the denominator. But when the Scopus impact factor is calculated, they take everything there, there is there as the denominator. So naturally the number of the denominator, the value in the denominator will increase because in each, uh, in especially in journals like the Nature, there are a lot of uh, articles by the editorial book. Okay, so while calculating the impact factor, uh, they do not calculate the uh, number of the uh, publications that are in the uh, in by the editorial board, but in the uh, Scopus they calculate that also. So that is why uh, it is generally a little low in side score. So now uh, here I have shown a simple comparison between the impact factor and the side factor. So here, uh, what you can see is that, uh, what is the basic difference between the impact factor and the side factor is that, basically the formula are the same, but here the evaluation year is two years, here the evaluation year is three years, and this is being taken, the database is JCR of the Clarivate Analyst Group or the SCI, SCI database. And here the database is the Scopus database. And uh, as of 2020, around 11,896 journals are there in the JCR. And in the uh, this, we have around 38,000 38, journals in the Scopus. So it's almost uh, four times that of the, almost 3.8 to 3.7 times of the uh, number of the journals that are there in the JCR or in the uh, SCI, SCI and SSCI database. And, uh, but the only thing, how aggressively the Elsevier has tried to market is that now they are giving out these uh, site score freely to anyone who want to, uh, who want to access it. They are giving the data to anyone. But generally, for Clarivate Analytics, we need to we need to subscribe to the we need to have a registered account with them, a paid account with them. Only then you can uh, access all the data. Anyhow, the uh, the basic document that is there, the JCR, that is freely out there. I will tell you where from where you can download it. But uh, the all the all the fine all the minute details are not available here. But in the site score, they give all the data as well as the uh, as well as the report. You can freely access it. And also I told you here in the evaluated items are only the articles and the review articles. And here all kinds of publications, whether it can be a data article or it can be a review article, it can be a letter to the editor, it can be a uh, editorial editorial note, everything is included in the calculation of the formula in site factor or in the site score. Similarly, uh, here I have just shown a plot, scatter plot for the uh, for two group of journals, it is the nature group of journals and for the ACS group of journals, ACS is American Chemical Society. For them, I have shown uh, how the site score and the impact factor are correlating. In case of uh, ACS, you see that the correlation is excellent, means almost the same kind of uh, value you get for the journal in terms of site score and the impact factor. But in nature, uh, the in journals from the nature, you see that the impact factor is generally higher than the site score. It is because in 
journals like Nature, there are a number of articles published by the editorial board. Similarly, um, the Elsevier always try to do something because Elsevier is trying to gain the market uh, because uh, till now Thomson Reuters has absolutely, Thomson Reuters or you can say the Caribbean and this group has the absolute monopoly in the market in terms of uh, the prestige associated with journal. Every, every serious uh, researcher wants to get his paper published in the SCI or the SCIE or the SSCI and he wants that his journal is impact factor. So in that, in that terms, the Scopus or the Elsevier has been trying to market their own products like the uh, things that I show you, for example, the size score or for example, the SJR. And in that same line, they have used another factor called the source normalized impact factor. They are also trying to calculate something called the source normalized impact factor from 2012 and the formula is this. So uh, let's not pay much attention to all this because as a serious researcher, you want your paper to be in the SCI, SCIE and the SSCI and for that you need to have a impact factor and if suppose say some of your particular papers do not meet that criteria then the next thing you, you should target is the scopus and once you go into scopus then uh, it doesn't make because again there is a lack of uh, uh, lack of ac acceptance among the scientific community regarding all these impact factors by the scopus so it doesn't make much difference that what your what the SGI value of your journal is or what the side uh, factor of your journal is, it doesn't make any difference if it is in Scopus. If it is in Scopus, it is well and good, at least from the Indian context. And again, we have something called the H index. So H index can be collected, uh, is calculated both by Google Scholar and Scopus. So for the Scopus, it is based on the papers that are contained in Scopus and for the, uh, for the Google Scholar, it is uh, based on all the papers that are contained in the Google Scholar. So H index is started for the authors. H index was started for the authors, and then the journals also started using it. So H index uh, is basically H index is basically the greatest number of publications H, which has a lifetime count of uh, which a life, which has a lifetime count of uh, H. So let me explain it to you by a very nice example. Let me show you my. Suppose so, this is my uh, Google Scholar profile. Uh, this is, if you see here, this is the number of citations. This is the H index. This is the I10 index that is listed out here. So basically, what H index is? If suppose H index means I have 11 publications or 11 papers, okay, in this database. If I am talking about Google Scholar, then in the Google Scholar database, I have at least 11 papers, which have individually at least 11 citations each. Okay, I'll repeat it again. H index means I have 11 papers and all of these 11 papers have at least 11 citations. It can be more than 11 citations, but it should have 11 cite at least 11 citations. So uh, H index is nothing but N, it is like a N, it is like a square matrix, okay? 11 by 11 matrix or suppose a 10 by 10 matrix. So you need to have the same number of, uh, you need to you need to have at least N number of papers having N number of citations, okay? So let us see from my example. Is suppose say my H index is one. So what you see here, my highest uh, citation till now in this particular paper is 21. So let us count from here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Okay. Till now, these are the 11 papers. Okay. This is the, this is the 11 paper and it has like 12 citations. Okay. Now let us go to the uh, 12 paper. This is the 12 paper. It has 11 citations. But now my, my H index is not 12. Why? Because this is the 12th paper and my 12th paper has only 12 citations, uh, only 11 citations. If suppose say my 12th paper also has 12 citations, my, then my then my H index will become 12 by 12. Right now, if you see all these 11 papers, all the 11 papers that I have above, all these 11 papers have at least 11 citations. So now my H index is 11. And if I come to the 12th paper, I have 12 papers which have 11 citations, but I do not have 12 papers which have 12 citations each. If I have 12 papers which have 12 citations each, then my H index will become 12. So as soon as this paper receives one more citation, my H index will become 12. Similarly, if I go one step down, so this is my 13th paper. So this is my 13th highest cited paper. So if suppose say this paper gets 13 citations, then also my H index will not be 13. Why? Because for that, this paper will also have to have 13 citations. This paper will also have to have 13 citations. 
it means all the papers that are above it if you arrange them in from highest citation to the low citation they should have the same number of citations at least the same number of citation as the number of publication so uh, that is the use of h index so h index means h number of papers that are having at least h number of citations if i have 10 papers with at least 10 citations then the h index is 10 if i have 11 papers with at least 11 number of citations in each of them then my h index is 11 and so on again in the same line let us also discuss what is i10 index my i10 index is 13 so i10 index is basically number of papers that you have in your uh, any database that has at least 10 number of citations so if you see uh, here so i have 13 papers this is the 13th paper and my 13th paper has 10 citations okay so that is why my i10 index is 13 so number of papers that has at least 13 number of uh, at, at least 10 number of uh, citations so that is the uh, i10 index so as soon as suppose say this particular paper gets one more citation then my i10 will become 14 as soon as this also gets one more citation then my i10 will become 15 because now this is also become 10 this is also become 10 and so on again if this also becomes 10 then my i10 will become 15 so i10 is basically as a num as the number suggests i10 is number of the publications that you have which have at least 10 number of citations okay this is just the number and h index is it is like a matrix okay it is like a n by n matrix or h by h matrix where one side of the matrix is the number of publications and the other side of the matrix is the number of the citations and that matrix always has to be a square matrix it, the always number always the x axis and y axis should be equal okay think of it in that way so uh, similarly here i have shown some example of this h index so similarly for a journal the h index can also be calculated because uh, for the journal it will be uh, suppose say h number of papers which have h number of citation each okay. for the journal also it can be calculated the h index again for calculation of the h index they will take the data for that particular year only uh, they will say that okay, or maybe they can take it for the entire uh, lifetime also suppose say if the uh, h index of a journal is 100 so it means the journal has published at least 100 papers which individually each of them has 100 100 citations that is the meaning of the h index in terms of the journal now <clears throat> i saw from the uh, discussion forum that there are a lot of questions on the predatory journals now this is something that i want you to stay away from or i want uh, researchers to i want to like communicate this to all the researchers that we should stay away from this kind of predatory journals so basically what predatory journals are predatory journals are like fraud journals or like fake journals okay so what they do is that they say that we are a good journal and they try to show you like that they are good journal but what actually they are doing is that they are just taking they are just after your money they will just tell that uh, pay us 2000 and we will publish your paper so you pay 2000 you publish your paper and without any review without any quality check whatever you give them that they will publish so and so what is the loss in this uh, for a researcher the first the first obvious loss is the loss of money okay because you are paying for some kind of cheap quality okay for some kind of cheap quality you are paying that is the first thing and the second loss that you have is the loss in the prestige the loss in the prestige is uh, if you publish in a predatory journal and someone a serious researcher or suppose say you are going for an interview and the interview board uh, knows that that this is a particular predatory journal so the first opinion that they will form about you is that you do not have the capability to publish in good journals that is why you are paying money and you are public publishing in this kind of fraud journal though you may not know though you you may have a very quality work and you may not know and you may have accidentally published in this by uh, by hearing the claims of the journal so in that way so you will be in trouble okay so predatory journals understand it like this that predatory journals are low standard journals or almost no standard journals they may maintain a very good website they may maintain a very good website they may uh, show you a editorial board that this and this is with us this professor from us is with us this professor from this with us but in actuality and they are just like rubber stamp okay and uh, the they will just take your money and they will publish any crap that you give them they will publish anything that you give them they will never review it there will be no quality check there will be nothing and whatever you give them they will publish this kind of journals are known as the predatory journals okay and the next thing is that because there is a uh, lack of awareness among the researchers that is why i find this uh, kind of 
workshops by the uh, RSRA group very commendable because what they're trying to do is they're trying to like uh, make the researchers or make the at least the early career researchers very aware about all these frauds that are going on or all these malpractices that are going on in the publishing or in the scientific community. So the next uh, thing is the fake impact factors. So there are a number of impact factors. Generally, uh, you may receive some uh, journal invitations that you can publish in this factor. So, so in, in this in this particular journal, so you'll you'll see that we have a journal impact factor. We have a we have a global impact factor. For example, this we have a global impact factor of five. You have a side factor of ten, or suppose a universal impact factor of eleven. So all these impact factors are fraud. Okay. As long as you see something, if you see something in fact factor with a trademark here, uh, and in the late in the somewhere in the footnote it is given calculated from Thomson Reuters, then it is a genuine impact factor or calculated by Thomson Reuters rather it should be calculated by Thomson Reuters that is a genuine impact factor. All these other kind of impact factors that you see out there in the different kinds of journals, global impact factor, universal impact factor, uh, for example, these are all some kind of fake impact factor. Similarly, there is something called the side factor also. So what these fake journals try to do is that they try to use similar kind of words. For example, here you saw that the uh, word was side school. So now some fraud has come up with a term called the side factor. Okay. So young researchers and uh, even the seasoned researchers are sometimes uh, confused and they think that, okay, it is also calculated by the scopus only because the name is like similar, but you should stay away from this. Okay. So until very recently, there is a, uh, librarian or a professor uh, in the university of colorado uh, jeffrey bell he maintained a very good list of all these kind of misleading metrics means all these kind of fake factors he maintained a list but then he had a lot of uh, because this fake publishing is a very multi-billion dollar industry so they all like uh, had some lobby and again he had some issue with his uh, university of colorado uh, means of uh, this and he had, had then he had to uh, uh, bring down that list. So now Jeffrey Bell's list is not maintained by him and it is not uh, you, it will not be available to you. But again, there are some substitutes that I'm going to tell you. So generally, what you should look at is that whether a journal is predatory or not, you should look at this whether this, whether the journal that uh, you are trying to publish that has any kind of this kind of uh, fake impact factors. If it has some fake impact factors, it simply means that it doesn't meet the quality standards of the uh, actual things like the Scopus or the uh, ESCA or the SCI. So that is why they have went for these fake imperfectors and that is why they are listing these fake imperfectors. So you should not publish this kind of predatory journals. So again and again, I'm telling you, predatory journals are only after your money. They, they have nothing to do with science have, and you will gain nothing by publishing in them. Okay, you'll gain nothing. You'll gain no reputation. Anyone who sees your CV and you, he sees that you have published, uh, suppose say one or two journals or any or three or four, papers in this kind of fake journals, then they will, uh, they will raise a serious kind of question on the, on your capability also. So that is why you should never publish in this kind of fake and predatory journals. Now, how to identify that whether a journal is predatory or not. So I'll just give you some rule of thumb. So the first thing what you can do is that, uh, I, I hope that in India you have heard about SCRC. SCRC is basically the structural engineering research group. Uh, that is, uh, a organization by the CSIR, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. So that is a independent body by the CSIR. So the SERC, they maintain, uh, a, they maintain a, a list called the Predatory Publishers and Journals list. So you can visit this website and you can see it here. So any particular journal which is listed in this particular list, never publish in that, okay? So that is basically they are, and they, it is for the awareness of the Indian population or rather for the scientific community that they have grouped all the, this kind of fake journals and the uh, predatory journals in this list. So always when you are, are not sure whether a journal is good or not, whether you should publish in this or not, you can visit any one of this list. Okay. And you should search here. If that particular journal is available in this list, never publish because these are the list which are, you consider this list as the blacklist kind of thing for yourself. Okay. So again, there is another list by the uh, bells called the bell list or nest and all this. So I, I will give this PPT uh, uh, through Ramachandran to all of you, to Professor Ramachandran to all of you, so that you can make use of this website. And that is the first rule of thumb that you should have. Or the other thing what you can do is that always try to publish in this particular journals. Okay. Always try to publish in journals which are listed either in SCI 
और इन एस और एस और स्कोपस और ई एस और डब्ल्यू एस ओके यू विल जस्ट सी हाउ यू कैन वेलीडेट वेदर ए जर्नल इज इन दिस लिस्ट ऑन आई विल जस्ट शो यू हाउ टू डू दैट एंड a lot of uh, people also know about the anna university annexures so a good list is that also if a particular journal is there in the anna university annexure try to publish in them if it is not there do not publish in them again uh, here is a word of caution about the ugc uh, ugc list or ugc care list i will tell you something see the ugc has come into action very uh, lately like only for the last i think last 3 or 4 years back they started uh, this uh, uh, journal like listing the journals as the ugc approved journals initially they started with the ugc approved word and now they have uh, they have changed it to the ugc care database but again i will say you that ugc is like a organization like a, it's it's like a uh, it's like a very uh, what will i tell you i do not want to use harsh words but i think it is uh, if you think of ugc in terms of its other counterparts in the developed countries like uh, for the similar kind of bodies that they have in us or europe or australia ugc is far far behind okay at least in the terms of publishing or at least in the terms of understanding the publishing business understanding the type of uh, journals and the edition so a lot of researchers i have seen that they they say that okay this particular journal is listed in the ugc care so this must be a good journal but i will tell you that the procedure for the ugc is that till now at least till now the procedure for the ugc is that all the universities that are affiliated to the ugc will send them a list sir we want this and these journals to be affiliated we we like a kind of uh, we vouch for them or, or we recommend this journal and ugc without till now it was the case that ugc without much uh, uh, scrutiny would include all these journals so a lot of time what happens is that a lot of private universities are also there even in from the lot of government universities also because of lack of knowledge or because of ignorance a number of is fake impacted journals or these fake Uh, predatory journals are also forwarded to the ugc and they end up giving approval to them also okay in fact in the last year uh, uh, they published a list the ugc published a list and in that list there were a number of predatory journals and a, then ugc because there were a lot of serious researchers so this researcher started mailing ugc that how can you include this journal in this particular or ugc approval list because it's a fake journal and then eventually uh, ugc launched a small scrutiny and again that was kind of a whitewash kind of thing and from that they removed 111 uh, journals from their website so now think of the researchers who might have published in that 111 journals during that period thinking that these journals are ugc approved right now that is not ugc approved so they are in trouble so what i will tell you is that uh, leave this means uh, do not do not rely on this ugc care so much rely mostly on this list because this is never going to change because uh, the quality of the journals that are in here they are not going to fall down drastically overnight they are not going to be removed overnight okay even if suppose say some journal is removed every year it happens that some journal is removed from the sci or the sci list but they will be downgraded to the esci and again they will be evaluated evaluated again after suppose say maybe two or three years they may again be included back similar thing with the scopus okay so that is why i always try to publish in journals that they are in this particular list also you may also see this particular list the anna university annexure list you can just go to the google and you can search I, i think right now the website is down but again i think maybe you can try it after one week so generally anna university annexure uh, is maintained by the anna university which is a uh, which is a top university in tamil nadu so they maintain this list so you can you can uh, like refer to this list and exclusively i i, I say that refer to the ugc list but do not rely on it 100% okay like just see that whether the particular journal is in ugc care then after that you try to see whether this journal is available in any of the other two list and then you try to publish because the ugc layer is uh, the ugc care list is not so uh, not so robust because ugc has not formulated the plans very effectively till now okay they are still uh, they have still a lot to learn in terms of the uh, publishing business they have still a lot to learn from the their uh, uh, like the developed counterparts in the developed countries so in that sense the uc list is not a very robust kind of list okay so be a little aware when you are publishing this now let me quickly tell you how you can access this particular list okay already we have uh, made this video quite large so just go to the scopus database just go to the scopus database if suppose say some journal suppose say this is the particular journal suppose say 
Uh, suppose say one journal is there in this particular journal, you do not know whether this journal is uh, uh, you should publish in this journal or not. So let's do one thing. If you want to uh, make sure that whether this journal is published in the is in the uh, Scopal database or not, so what you should do is that type www.scopus.com. As soon as you go to the scopus.com, you will see this bar. You will see author search and sources. You just click on sources, then we will come to this page. Okay. As soon as you uh, <clears throat> as soon as you come on this page, what you should do is okay. As soon as you come on this page, suppose say you know the title of the journal. In this case, you know the title of the journal. So just make this give this as title. Just go here. Just paste the name here. Okay, and find there are two kind of names they have shown. Okay, this is the journal that the name I was seeing. So just click on this. As soon as you click on this, all history of this journal in this particular Scopus database will be shown to you. So it shows that uh, the Scopus has maintained this particular journal in their database from 1989 to present. So this word is important. Sometimes it may be from 1989 to 2019. So it means this year they have still not decided whether it will be in the uh, Scopus database or not. So that is also important for you to see. So always try to see that whether it is to present or not. 1989 to present so it means this particular journal is listed here so generally all the good journals that they have they will have a uh, the journal homepage tab also here so from here you can validate whether you are this is the correct journal that you wanted to that you wanted to submit it for example when you click it here it will take you to the to their website suppose say this is the journal it is supposed to say 3.35 impact factor. Uh, we'll look into that later. See, the side factor is also somewhat similar. 3.5 is the side factor for 2018. For 2018, it was published in 2019. And for 2019, now it will be published in 2020. So again, some other additional information you can get here. That what is the side factor? See, this kind of data that you get here. And you can also see what is the category rank. For example, in the mechanical engineering, uh, it is somewhere in the 88th percentile. It is in the top. 12 to 13 percent okay it is its rank is 66 out of 583 and similarly in a subdomain called the mechanics of materials it is in the 87 percentile and so on all this kind of data is also being shared with you in the scopus database so like this you can validate whether a particular journal is in the scopus database or not so it will also show you the history okay so it will also show you the trend of the impact factor and all that okay and it will also show you that what is its uh, rank wise in which particular uh, in which particular uh, this is uh, in which particular category it is okay. so again let us go to side score there are some certain other uh, uh, statistics available here so again it will show you that in suppose say in 2019 it has published at least 180 documents which are in scopus in 2018 it has published 211 documents so this tab is important when you look at something so you see in 2020 it has already listed 67 documents so it means it is an existing document it is an existing journal which is in the scopus database because uh, indexing is still going on so this is kind of safe to publish in okay this is how you access the scopus database now again i have uh, given the link for this also the clavier analytics list also uh, it is available here somewhere i think it is available yeah i have given it I given it here so i will be sharing this ppt so you can use this website you can bookmark this website so for uh, understanding whether a particular journal is in the uh, this list or not so go to this website uh, click on this search journals so it will come to this particular window as soon as you come to this window you can give the name of the journal here and you can search any journal that you want to publish in you can type the name here but the name should be exact and then you should search. So this is the result that is showing you. Now immediately see this web of code, uh, web of science code collection. So it is in the SCIE list. Okay, it is in the SCIE list. So this is a safe journal to publish it. This is a non predatory a very reported journal. So this is uh, again all the information you will get. For example, this journal is published by the Taylor and Francis group and its ISS and all this kind of information you will get. If you want more information, you can just click here, view profile page. And uh, I think for this you need a login. So login you can you can log in by any of your Google uh, ID, suppose or by LinkedIn or by Facebook, anything you can log in. For this you need not pay anything. Just click. I'll just click on the Google. 
as soon as he gives me this, I'll just click here and I'll be logged in. Okay. I, this is kind of the basic login. And there is a, again, this is kind of a free account that you can have. Again, there's something called a paid account, no need for that. So this is the free account. So at, uh, as soon as you go inside, so it will show you all the data. For example, from 1986, this journal is indexed in the SCI. And every year it publishes 12 issues. It is, it, it is in the English language. It has been published by USA. Uh, again, the publisher website is listed here. The submission website is listed here. All this kind of information is listed here. So this is the most, most important thing. You have to see whether the journal that you're going to publish, whether it is in the SCI or the SCI E list or the ESCI list. So that information is available from here. Okay. And again, <clears throat> uh, it also shows that uh, this information that this journal was covered in the 2019 JCR or the journal citation reports. And from there, you can access the impact factor. The impact factor is the most recent impact factor is 3.35, right? And if you have the access to the full, if you have the subscription of the full uh, disk of the Clever Analytics, then you could have access this information also. But since my account is a free account, so I cannot access this information. But for the basic kind of analysis, this is enough. Means I, I, I now know that this particular journal is safe to publish it. So having said that, that brings us to the end of this session. So I hope that uh, all of you have found this session meaningful. All of you have found this session interesting and uh, with full of information. I hope that I could have uh, busted some of the myths out there. I hope that all of you uh, will do sound research and I hope that all of you will publish in very good effective journals or uh, you'll publish in journals which are in either of in either of these two lists. With that in mind, I thank you all of you. Thank you.